China. So I'd like to talk about how we can uh, expose Ambul. And over the years, we and others have found out that the virus does a very good job at keeping the infected cells, which is an, a factory produce thousands of infectious viral particle, they keep it invisible to the immune system. And one way it does that is by keeping, by keeping its envelope closed. And the virus develops several strategies to achieve this. And it has these two bodyguard accessory proteins, NEF and VPU, that do then regulate CD4 from the cell surface. If you delete them, what happens is that the envelope will interact with CD4, it will pop up, and it will expose a highly immunogenic uh, um, region, vulnerable regions that will result in antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And it works extremely well in vitro. Um, but this is not about NEF and VPU. This is about the shape of the envelope, the conformation of the envelope. So if you remember, remember the RB144 trial, which was held in Thailand, the CRFA strain that circulates there has a naturally occurring histidine at 375. That slightly open up the trimer, despite NEF and VPU not regulating CD4. And, and, and we believe at least that this could have been linked to this uh, ADCC activity associated with potentially protection. The problem is that we cannot fill the, 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 put an histidine in every single virus, or we cannot delete NEF and VPU, but it will be in inhibitors of NEF and VPU will be certainly welcome. But what can we do is that we can use small CD4 metrics, which were uh, developed over the years, uh, and to use to open up the trimer, they bind in the felling 43 cavity at the same place that CD4 in, uh, interacts. They bind, pop up the trimer to expose actually this envelope uh, to the, these vulnerable epitopes to the immune system. And we, uh, we started working on this uh, back in, in, in 2015. So uh, it actually works extremely well, both in vitro, ex vivo, and I will show uh, some data in vivo uh, in human ice mice. But, before that, I like to put something uh, to explain this, which is it's not just magic. We put the mimetic, it pops up, and that's it. Now, we found out that the mimetics are good, they're strong, they open up the trimer, but not completely. It's just enough for the co-receptor binding site family of CD4 induced antibodies to bind. And upon binding of the co-receptor binding site, it further opens up the trimer. So another family of antibodies, which are also CD4 induced, recognize the cluster A, a completely hidden. Uh, place of the envelope, which is actually beautifully conserved on all HIV strains. And that binding actually further opens up the trimer, and now it's able to engage with uh, NK cells and actually kill the infected cells. We also find out actually that the FC portion of these two family of antibodies, which are present in plasma from all infected individuals, are required to mediate the killing. So in other words, the mimetic alone doesn't work. We need a cocktail of antibodies that likely enough is present in infected individuals. But the question we had is, OK, what is the conformation of the envelope that is stabilized by this cocktail of cluster A, co-receptor binding site, and small CD4 metric? So we went back to the work done by uh, Jens Monroe and Walter Motes. I'm not going to go into the detail, but happy to answer uh, some technical questions about how this is done. This is single molecular threat analysis. We give you an idea of the conformational landscape of the envelope. And in the unliganded trimer, the trimer samples what is called a state one conformation, a closed conformation, we transit to stage two and end up in stage three. So together with Chen Monroe, we did we should report we reported this experiment back in 2019. We were repeat the experiment. We got the same data. This always welcome when we repeat <laughs> a, a result after several years. And then we asked what happened when we had this mimetic. We saw a bump here and very high threat, suggesting that something here is changing, but it wasn't big. We add the mimetic together with the co-receptor binding site, and no much change. But what happened was you had the full cocktail, the mimetic, coreceptor binding site, and cluster A. Hopefully, you can appreciate that we have this fourth conformation, which we uh, name state two because it's deriving from state two and A for ADCC. Because when you stabilize this conformation, plasma from infected individuals becomes suddenly extremely efficient and eliminate themselves from ADCC. So, how does it look? We did some low resolution cryo EM with um, Isabel Rouillet and Melbourne. Here, well, all what I can say, right, is that it's an asymmetric conformation. But if you compare it to the UL, uh, the Subramanian um, cryo EM that was done at the time with 82 inactivated viral particles from um, Jeff Lifson, we took the same viral particles, we add the cocktail, and I hope you can appreciate that we are opening up the trimer in this asymmetric conformation. And finally, the trimer is exposed in regions that normally doesn't want to. So. OK, I, I told you I'm not going to show it, but I, I told you that it works in vitro, works in vivo. Does it work in vivo? So we team up with um, uh, Priti Kumar at Yale, who has these amazing uh, humanized mice 
with functional NK cells, so human NK cells, because it's a enokin for IL-15 from humans. And we, we ask what happened when we add the, our cocktail? Does it affect somehow the, 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 the total DNA, right? It's not the best surrogate of as measure of a reservoir. I will come back to that in a second. But so mock treated mice in riot, when you provide the cocktail, actually the mimetic together with plasma from infected individuals, or the, 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 the cocktail with corocetrobanisat and cluster A antibodies, you can see that this is a significant decrease in, in all tissues, but for the bone marrow. For a good reason, the mimetic didn't reach the bone marrow, and we went that by mass spec. Is this FC dependent? Well, uh, what we did is that we depleted the NK cell from the mice, and the effect was gone. And we can, uh, we can actually quantify this decrease, how much is NK dependent. But uh, I, I like to, it's all described in this paper that was published last year. Actually, if you provide the cocktail, but with FC impaired antibodies, right, A3217B, but with the LALA mutation, you lose the effect. So this decrease in, in total DNA, integrated DNA, is actually FC dependent. But because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not one, someone who actually knows really how to measure the reservoir, we thought that potentially times to viral rebound could be a good surrogate. So what we did is that we infected here uh, uh, with GRCSF, this uh, human SRG15. We infect the mice, the virus goes up, provide ART. And then at the time of ART withdrawal, what we do is that we provide the cocktail. Actually, we provide every single component of the cocktail alone or in combination. If you provide the, and then we let, let it go and measure viral rebound. If you said any, if the cocktail is not complete, so the mock treated that in red, or if you provide the mimetic alone or the antibodies alone, but never the full, the whole uh, cocktail, the virus rebounds pretty much to the same, with the same efficiency very rapidly. But when you provide the right cocktail, we have a truly dramatic, dramatic, I don't know if it's dramatic, but certainly significant de uh, um, delay in viral rebound. And this actually, of course, inversely correlates with the depletion of CD40 cells. So what, what, what is very nice here is we have a long-term model, humanized mice, where we can do this kind of experiment. We need, of course, to improve the way how we provide the mimetic. We have way more potent mimetics now. And there is a lot of things that we like to uh, play with. Uh, for instance, CD80 cell depletion. It was funny because if you deplete CD80 cell here at this point, you get a very rapid viral rebound, really indicating that below a threshold, the CD8 start to play a, a role. And we are working on it. But to some extent, this is a cocktail. You need a mimetic or recital binding side cluster A, and we love it because most infected, all infected individuals we look at have these two family of antibodies. But therapeutically, we were thinking whether rather than having these three components, we could make one, all in one. And, and what we developed these hybrids. Here we put these uh, other uh, CD, the cluster A antibodies, um, hybrid with soluble CD4, the T1, uh, D1, D2 domain, or with the coreceptor binding site to see as a proof of concept. And now we are moving to make conjugate with the new generation of small CD4 mimetics. So this work that we did in collaboration with uh, Marcina Pasquier, and this gives you an idea. The beauty of this is that the region that these antibodies are uh, binding is, are extremely, extremely uh, conserved because they are very important for trimer stability. Certainly for this is true for the cluster A region. So as an example here, if I put you all you know, uh, coreceptor binding site 17B, what you see is that it doesn't bind infected cells. Um, uh, if you add soluble CD4, it will open up and you will bind a bit, but the, this hybrid that we made binds very efficiently. It binds pretty much to the same extent that 3 bnc 117 a very potent vinyl, which is in the clinic and that Michel Nussen and I have working a lot on. It. X5 is another coreceptor binding site antibodies very, very same result. Soluble CD4 is able to open up and it works, but the hybrids do a good job. What is interesting, though, is the cluster A antibodies. As I told you before during the presentation, you can add soluble CD4, you can add small CD4 mimetics. These antibodies will not open. You normally need to add the mimetic or soluble CD4 together with coreceptor binding site. However, these hybrids immediately are able to bind to the same extent that uh, 3BNC117, and this, of course, we can reproduce. We use um, uh, primary CD40 cell from several donors. Does it kill? This is what we are interested in, in the lab. And, uh, and if you provide the antibody alone, nothing happened. You, if you, to 17B, even though that soluble CD4 allows 17B to bind, 17B is not a good killer, but the hybrids are. And for N5 by 5, which is a cluster A, same, same answer. And actually, this is a pretty good level of killing in the acid that we are using, uh, uh, which is flow based. And I can talk later about it. What is very nice, we developed a virus capture assay. Again, this, we reported this assay in 2019 in JVI, but overall you get, what you can see is that these CD4 induced antibodies that alone are unable to capture a viral particle, the first column, 
Of course, the co-receptor binding site, you add salvo C4, they were able to capture to some extent, but the hybrids are able to catch water particle immediately. And what was very, to some extent, surprising, A32, for instance, is the definition of a non-neutralizing antibody. Even the presence of soluble CD4 is unable to do anything, but these hybrids do neutralize and their breadth is incredible because the cluster A region is absolutely conserved. How does it compare to the stage two A cocktail, to the cocktail? So again, if you add the cluster A antibodies alone, there is no killing. You can add soluble CD4, she's, she's wasting reagent. Of course, it's not gonna kill. If you provide the cocktail, for which at this level of killing is what we got in the humanized mice with a very significant delay in viral rebound. Again, I show you some plasma from infected individuals, they don't kill if you, if you, if you face them to well type infected cells. But if you have the hybrid that we develop, uh, this is a cluster A hybrid, they reach already the same level of the, uh, our cocktail. And in the presence of plasma, some have some specificity of antibodies present in plasma, further enhance the capacity of this hybrid to mediate killing. And actually, um, because of lack of time, I, I was told I have only 20 minutes, we have very exciting data in humanized mice, again, uh, uh, supporting um, NK function, that this hybrid are able to significantly impair, uh, decrease the size of the reservoir in an FC dependent manner. And now we are moving to change this soluble CD4, which was kind of a proof of concept moiety, right? By this potent uh, small CD4 mimetic. Just to tell you, it took us five years to find the lens between the soluble CD4 and the antibody, but now we got it. So some people, and sometimes uh, actually uh, uh, Jean-Pierre tell me, but why do we need to develop all of this? Is non-neutralizing antibodies were described, right? To be able to affect uh, uh, and, uh, and decrease infected cells in vivo. And this is some of the work is by this beautiful paper from that some of you may know, the Horwitz paper from Emission Nussenweig using these non-neutralizing antibodies 246D, where they really show that actually these antibodies is able um, to uh, clear infected cells in vivo. So why do we need to go and develop ways to open up the trimer if these non-neutralizing antibodies do the job immediately right off the bat? So here, just taking some of, some, some, some of the figure from, from, from Michelle's uh, work, you have 246D here, it's a CD4 induced GP41 antibody. He shows clearly the compared to the control. If you provide this in humanized mice infected with this HIV YU2, it's able to decrease the amount of infected cells. Actually, if you provide the FC competent 246D, the virus tries to escape from it, right? But if you put the GRLR, uh, so it's unable to engage with FC media, uh, with uh, enable with FC gamma receptor, so cannot mediate FC mediated effector function. So you can see there is no pressure. So clearly these non-neutralizing antibodies in vivo in this model is able to put some pressure because the virus hates it. Um, but if you go, if you take the time to go to, the, to Michel's paper, you go to supplemental figure one, this virus is VPU minus. So we were wondering whether some of these results were somehow linked to the fact that in this context, they were using a virus that is defective for VPU. And back in 2013, we already say that VPU is extremely important for EDCC responses. So uh, uh, Jeremy uh, Prevost in the lab just uh, restored the open rating frame of VPU here. We developed some intracellular staining so we can now follow, can follow by fax VPU expression and an F expression as well. So the, the original virus used by, by Michelle is in black, doesn't express VPU. If you restore the open reading frame, of course it's express VPU and you see that NEF is expressed in both contexts. And does it, uh, how does it behave with the ligands? It normally doesn't regulate. Well, the virus that they use doesn't fully then regulate CD4. NEF does some job here in black, but you really need to have VPU expression to then regulate CD4, of course, to then regulate BST2 and to then regulate some of stress ligands actually that are important for NKC killing. So if you use, the VPU defective virus, you have a, a lot of CD4 out there, you have a lot of BST2, and you have a lot of stress ligands. So you, your infected cell is, is begging to be killed, okay? So this is not a one-off. Here you have a thing uh, we tested in primary C40 cell from at least five different donors, and you can see in all the cases, uh, VPU expression result in CD4 then regulation, BST2, et cetera. So nothing, nothing new here, but good to tell you that we can reproduce that. How does it impact envelope conformation? Well, if you use the VPU defective in black, you can see that again, 246D is extremely well exposed and some of this binding is decreased by VPU expression. Long story short, we try a panel of a lot of uh, GP41 antibodies and in all the cases is VPU dependent. That has a dramatic impact or very significant impact in FC gamma receptor, right? Of course, the VPU minus uh, the infected cells 
are bound by the antibodies, which are able to recruit uh, FC gamma receptor. And this also, of course, decreasing very good uh, killing. Okay, but this killing is uh, significantly decreased if you uh, restore VPU expression. You can also talk, what about BNAMs? Because if VPU is not there in black, you have a lot of BST2 out there trapping viral particles. So you have a lot of envelope viral particles there. And actually, you can see that the binding goes up, of course, in the VPU defective. If you restore VPU, binding will go down. FC gamma receptor will go down, and ADCC will go down. So to some extent, I will come back perhaps later to that, but I think it is very important to use fully replication competent infectious molecular clones. Uh, but what about uh, virus, not chimeric virus? Uh, I don't know, primary viruses, right? Here we have a panel that we got from Beatrice Han. Of course, we have our controls, the NF4.3 and, uh, and F4.3 uh, where you choose VPU minus. But in, any, in all the cases, you can see that the recognition by uh, non-neutralized antibodies and by BNAPs is, of course, uh, VPU dependent. And this translates into killing. So what if we don't infect the cells ourselves? We take cells from patients, we reactivate ex vivo, we let the virus grow and we see how well these uh, ex vivo reactivated cells actually are recognized by 246D, right? Everything started with this antibody. Recognition is there, there is some binding, not good, certainly less so than PGD-121, but it's unable to really engage FC gamma receptor 3A when you use uh, cells from patients, uh, from infected individuals, and Sertra is unable to kill. So the question was, the standing question was, what happened in vivo in humanized mice? So we use, uh, with, with Priti Kumar, of course, we should re reproduce the data uh, that Michel got, right? That if you infect here, where the virus will, um, and this is the same virus, uh, Michel sent it to us, the virus will, 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 will replicate very efficiently in 246D treated mice, you have a significant impact in viral replication. But when you restore VPU, this difference is gone. Okay, but again, to some extent, don't get me wrong, I have nothing, there's nothing wrong about these non-neutralizing antibodies. It's not, I, we don't hate them. Here you have 246D. And just to prove you, that to you, we play in different flavors. We made 246D where we mutated the FC gamma receptor function, GRLR unable to mediate ADCC. The gas daly, very potent at mediating ADCC. VPU minus, you can see that if you mutate the FC, it doesn't affect the recognition of VPU minus or VPU positive infected cells. Here we have a, a well, primary virus, and you can see how the recognition of these three antibodies, the same antibody, but three different flavors, is NEF, VPU, and NEF, VPU dependent. But what I care here is to bring the CD4 metric. Hopefully you can appreciate that you can use with a primary virus where the binding is not very good. You add the small CD4 metric, and you get the same level of binding that you normally get with NF minus U minus. This is important. We can use non-neutralizing antibodies. We can, we can leverage their capacity to mediate some level of killing by open up the, opening up the trimer. Why? Because infected cells do express NF and VPU. So we need to open up. So what about killing? If you use the VPU negative, again, of course, you're going to have some killing, which is FC dependent because the Jared R doesn't have any killing. And they got added, but killing is better. But if you use a VPU positive virus, when we restore the open reading frame, you can see that there is no killing unless you push the gas daddy to some extent. But just not to repeat myself, again, the Chavi well type, independently of the variant of the antibody you use, these cells are completely resistant to 24060, uh, even if you present the gas daddy. But you can render them susceptible by adding small CD4 mimetic. So we believe small CD4 mimetic are a powerful tool to work with uh, wild type infected cells. We have data in vivo, and we have more potent mimetic that we're gonna be describing soon, but they are, I mean, uh, at least 10 times more potent than what you, I'm presenting you here. And on top of that, we're working with new cocktail of antibodies, which are more potent as well. If I still have time, I hopefully I do have some time, I like to, uh, I'd like to work a little bit about uh, an observation that we made, and I think, is about affecting the shape of the envelope in a different way by using a different molecule, which is called Temsevir, which is known as a conformational blocker, which is actually FDA approved. Um, and, this, and this molecule is known not to open up the trimer. It is known to close up the trimer. And this work led by Walter Maltes and Joe Zodrowski. And this is an observation. Uh, and actually it was published as an observation. It's gonna be online very soon at Bio. Because one of my students came to see me. So normally people, when you work with stem severe, just put the drug for 30 minutes and the envelope will close up. But in infected individuals, the drug is there for months actually, because these people are getting that from treatment for months. So I say, why don't we put the drug overnight? And, my, and the student in Milan got this observation that each time he did it, the GP120 was migrating the slides faster. 
And he was a bit, ah, should do I need to repeat? Yes, please do. And every time he did the experiment, it migrated faster. And also he observed that there is a decrease in, in, in cleavage. And as you know, envelope glycosylation and cleavage do affect envelope conformation. So uh, we did the dose response, as you can see here, even a very low concentration of this Temsavir, you have the effect on a fast, uh, fast migrating GP120, both in the cell license and in the supernation. And if, if we went to even lower concentration, we use here 2G12, which binds ligands in the outer domain, it uh, binds um, glycans in the outer domain. And at very, very low concentration of Temsavir, we still have the effect. We use, of course, PGT151, beautiful surrogate. It actually binds the interface between the 120 and the 41, and all it binds only is the envelope is cleaved. And you can see that at a very, a low concentration, the envelopes start to look uh, differently because PGT-151 is unable to bind efficiently because of the cleavage problem. So we have an envelope that is not fully cleaved, is not extremely well glycosylated. Does it affect something? As you can see here, these are two natural T cells, point well taken. I'll show you with primary CD4 T cell in a minute. But I, I can show you here a panel of antibodies. If you treat the cell for 30 minutes only, some will go up because the drug is a conformational blocker, will stabilize state one. But if you treat overnight, you have this very significant decline in pretty much all the antibodies where we're looking at. The envelope of Temsavir treated uh, cells looks like something else that we are not, it's, it's not the same envelope. <laughs> And you can see here how it looks if we put them all of them together. These are two natural T cells, right? What about viral particle? Oh, sorry. Just to try to tell you that this is uh, um, specific. We added Temsavir to uh, cells expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike. Doesn't affect anything. <laughs> but the best control to do is to use the same envelope from HIV-1, GRFL, but with the S375 tryptophan mutation, which we know is resistant to Temsavir. And then you lose the effect. So this is specific. How about viral particles? So again, we have this virus capture acid that we developed. We reported in 2019. I can go later on if you want to explain how it works. But even at the surface of our particles, if you the cell, the viral particles produced from tips have treated cells, the envelope is unclipped, has glycosylation defect, and it looks like something, something different. What about primary CD40 cells? So here we took, I think, uh, primary CD40 cells from seven different donors. And again, you can see that treated, uh, the, the infected cell with stem severe has a very significant impact, almost an, an antigenic shift of uh, HIV-1 envelope. And actually this um, affect the recognition. Uh, this, of course, will translate into a very, uh, so the, the infected cells treated with stem severe become resistant to, to BNAP by the HDATCC. It is important uh, because um, the field is moving to immunotherapy, like in cancer, right? And temsavir treated individuals, this suggests that temsavir treated in the, in, in the fos temsavir, people receiving fos temsavir is the drug that they are, they are getting. Um, the hormone will look some, like something else, slightly different. And, and they may, the immunotherapy that people are developing for people who are on, on the regular art may not be as efficient in terms of treating individual. So there's a lot of things we are very, very excited by this because GP120 looks different when it's released. The envelope is kind of, you are inducing an antigenic shift of the HIV-1 envelope. So we are very excited by this. And I don't know how I did with time, but that was my last slide. I'd like to, to thank the people in the lab, mostly Jeremy, Jonathan, Nierman, and Marianne, who did most of the work I present today, collaborator, funding, and you for your attention. Thank you.